Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the NIS TED Ed Club. This is our TED event for the year where we will now be presenting through this online platform. So I want to start off this event by introducing what we do as a club. So in TED Ed, each of us create our own TED presentations about our topic of our choice. And then towards the end of the school year, we will present them in a um, TED event. And in um, TED Ed clubs, we try to take our time to think about our interests and passions and what we want to share through the TED Talks. And then we would sort of discuss them among each other in meetings. So TED Ed clubs is more than just um, our personal TED Talks, but it's also about having peers who would sort of discuss and share <clears throat> your interest with you. And then we also try to help each other create these talks. Um, as a club, we also tried to connect with the other TED clubs in different schools. So previously, we've done like connect calls with schools in India and Korea. Um, this year has been a little difficult, difficult for us because we were all sort of put on hold after the impact of COVID-19. Um, and we all had to stay under quarantine, but we were still able to communicate and organize this event. So yeah, we hope you enjoy this event. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, before we begin, I just want to ask the viewers to um, not to type or share the names of the presenters in the comments, but you are also most welcome to co comment as we do this event. Okay, and without further ado, I would like to present the NIS TED Ad presentation. Okay, so now we have our first presenter talking about identity. Thank you. So today, I would like to start with a really simple question. How often do people ask you where you come from? For some people, it might be pretty easy to answer. For me, I'm Japanese, but also Chinese. And I'm also, I'm also sort of Canadian. So if someone asks me to answer this question, it will be more than five words for me to describe myself. Due to globalization, the world is becoming smaller and smaller nowadays. And with that, the kids from mixed cultures are also increasing almost every single year. So today, I'd like all of you here to think about how could we give all these kids who come from mixed cultures the place that makes them feel safe and also the space that, can they, uh, that they can discover who they are. Here's an example from my own story. The relationship between China and Japan was politically pretty much sensitive when I was in elementary school in Japan. And at that time, even I was 10 or 11 years old, we could still get all the information from the news or social media or even family. So even at my school, many friends of mine were saying kind of negative stuff about China. And truth be told, I couldn't even tell people around me that the fact that I'm half Chinese. But on the other hand, when I back to when I go back to see my Chinese family in China, I couldn't tell some Chinese people that I'm that I that I'm half Japanese, because I was really scared and always thinking that if I tell my friends uh, where I come from, I will lose my friends around me or they might see me differently. I was ten years old, but when you feel like you don't really belong to anywhere, and that kind of fear is not something that you can easily forget about. And also, I remember I was always questioning who I am and what kind of person that I should be or, or what each uh, certain culture is expecting you to become. Because I really felt this pressure that I don't even know where that comes from, but it was just telling me that I must choose a side in order to fit in. But unfortunately, I couldn't because I don't want to. And also, why should I? It is true the fact that we are now living in this exponential times and then there are millions of ways to get the news that shapes the way we perceive others. But I believe all of them shouldn't stop us from defining ourselves because I believe we have the right to choose our identity for ourselves. And that happened when I was 10 years old and now I'm 17. But I still remember this fear that I faced and then that made me feel I don't know where to belong. And over time, there is one thing that changed, and that's me. 
Because please think about this. Today, there are 1.5 billion people who speak English, and almost 1.5 at、uh, 1.4 billion people who speak Mandarin, and 130 million people who speak Japanese. And the world population is about seven point eight billion right now. So if I calculate this using my my fantastic math skills, I can connect with almost thirty percent of the world population to share my cultures, value, and also delicious food through languages. That's why now I just feel who cares? The things that I have now is a gift, and that makes me special and unique. And I'm sure my first language will be Spanish. As people around these kids who come from this、uh, mixed cultures or multiple、uh, identities should not see them through the lens of what they see or what they hear from、uh, from the local news or their parents, but please, please get to know the person, their personality or hobby, and one day you will realize the significance for people to be who they are, and that makes a community that can help people to accept who they really are. As Eric Erickson highlighted. In this social jungle of human existence, there is no feelings of being alive without sense of identity. Thank you for listening. So our next speaker will talk about that. There, his title is about knowing yourself. Okay, so imagine that you're doing extremely well in a particular sport, class, job, and anything else. You're getting good reputation; everyone was trusting you, and you've been getting good grades. And also imagine that one day that performance declines, and then you also realize that reputation is going down. Personally, I define reputation as the opinion and beliefs that other people have towards me or like you. And although we often hear that life has many ups and downs, I think we all agree that it's difficult to accept some of our failures. With that being said, I want to talk about the importance of knowing yourself. And I saw I knew myself pretty well. I know that I like playing soccer. I know that when there is time, I prefer to, well, spend my time with my friends, text people, talk with people. I also know that I get very, very sleepy and tired after lunch. All the classes that I have after lunch, I was almost every time fighting against sleepiness. However,、um, I actually found out that I. Was not knowing myself that well, and I want to talk about my experience as a soccer player, where I experienced、um, being a starter in the A team and then dropping all the way down in the B team. That experience made me realize I was still immature and didn't know myself that much. First of all, being a starter in a soccer team or in sports in general, it's one of those very honorable, great opportunities. You realize that your, all your hard work has been paid off, and your coaches have realized it. Personally, I felt really confident playing. As, personally, as a player who plays in the center and also in the side, I was constantly running up and down the field, giving instructions to my teammates, controlling the game, and I felt like I was doing my job. But then, one day, you play in a game, and I, and I clearly remember that that game. It was a very rainy day, and my performance wasn't one of those best times ever. My body was very heavy, and all the small mistakes that I made in that game gave me a lot of pressure. And then you realize that game, your team lost, and was it wasn't one of your best games. 
what and even more worse what happened was the game the day after that game we had a practice and then i realized that my name was called in more of the b team side often my coach at that time preferred to separate between an a team member and a b team member and i found myself that i was more in the b team side First of all, being a B team member isn't a bad thing because it's an opportunity for you to be humble, to be hungry. And also in general, it's a time for you to get that enough experience so that you can go back into A team or go up to A team. But for me at that time, I had my reputation and I saw my reputation was very high. So I was very embarrassed and stressed. And even more, I really, really wanted to take back my position. So after that, I was really focusing on trying to improve on what I couldn't do on that rainy day game. I constantly asked myself to run more. I constantly asked myself to be more aggressive, be more powerful. And I worked really, really hard. But still, uh, then I still realized that my reputation hadn't changed. And it was, uh, I was still in that kind of B team position. Time was only flowing. As that continued for a couple of months and so, I had a conversation with my soccer coach. I took that time as an opportunity for me to ask him a simple question. Why haven't I been part of A team for such a long time? And for me, that was a very, very important opportunity. It was a moment of realization for me. It was an epiphany, which also means a moment of realization. I realized that I was very, very busy focusing on my weaknesses. I wasn't even, I had zero attention on my strengths and I had zero attention on trying to show what I can do as a soccer player that is unique from others. Simply, I was overthinking. My brain was packed with a bunch of checklists of all the stuff that I had to improve. At that time, I was very stressful because I wasn't showing. I wasn't showing my full. Uh, at, that, at that time, I was very stressful because I was not capable of overcoming my weaknesses. However, if I were to be stressful at that time, I should have been stressful because I wasn't showing my full potential, my own unique character in the field. And after I had that moment of realization, Soccer started to, found, to, to sound um, feel very fun and very enjoyable. My mindset was very clear. I knew what I needed to do. I had a simple mindset and overall I felt relaxed. And that small change in the way I approached to sports and to soccer, that was the key turning point for me to get back my position as I wanted it to be, a starter and a player in D18. And from that time, when I had a conversation with my coach, I realized to myself and I was able to know myself even more. I mean, I realized that I am a person who overthinks when stuff doesn't go into the right direction. And in the future, I have to be careful about that. But at the same time, it was also a time for me to appreciate how much I dedicate and think a lot into one thing. So my final message is, it is very difficult to know about yourself. But if you keep working hard and if you simply keep moving forward, I think you will find an opportunity where you will realize something, an opportunity where you'll be able to know yourself even more and an opportunity that you will be able to appreciate your own simple, your own character. Overall, the talks I've made right now has been very simple and it might sound very cliche, but at that time when I was being dropped into B team for a couple of months, my mindset wasn't simple. And I learned a lot how much it's, how much it's important to have a simple mindset and keep moving forward. Thank you very much. And now our next talk will be about achieving your dreams.
Hi, today my TED Talk is, like he said, about achieving your dreams. Around six months ago, I, as I asked myself this question. If you knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you accomplish today? Now, six months ago, things were completely different. COVID-19 had not become a widespread pandemic. There weren't major isolation and quarantine affecting everyone and so much more. As a student, I went to school, I talked and learned with my friends and teachers. I came back, repeat. Stores, restaurants, malls, amusement parks were all open. We could do anything, meet anyone, go anywhere. Life was our normal. And yet, even with all these opportunities, I still met a lot of people that just seemed unsatisfied or bored with their lives. For them, life had become a cycle. Go to school, go to work, return home, sleep. Finding yourself so focused on your work that you miss out on some of life's greatest experiences. Trying to find the time instead of making it. And if you don't find the time, you procrastinate. You say to yourself, instead of today, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, I have time tomorrow. I don't have time today. Life becomes a cycle and we end up not truly living. And that's when I thought of this question. If you knew that the world was gonna end today, what would you do today? For every one of us, each day comes with its own battles. We face stress, challenges, and unpredictability, and we need to work hard in order to be adaptable and maintain balance. So how do we get through all of this? How do we balance our time in order to lead a more fulfilling life? How do we break that cycle so we can focus on what we can accomplish today instead of what we can accomplish tomorrow? Well, there's this inescapable word that I hear no matter where I go, no matter what language, culture, religion, or country. And it's something that we all need in each and every one of our lives. Dreams. Dreams drive change. They motivate and inspire. They change our future. Our entire world is made up of the dreams of those before us, and our future will be made from our dreams. If we act based on our own personal dreams, if we allow ourselves the opportunity to pursue our passions, no matter what those passions are, we break that cycle. We give each and every day meaning and importance. Tomorrow becomes today. Later becomes now. You've all heard of this before, the typical, you can achieve your dreams, nothing is impossible. But have you actually achieved your dreams? All of them? How many times have people said to you, oh, oh, that's, that's a nice dream, but try to choose something more realistic. And how many times did you listen to them? Now, I wanna tell you a true story about this man in his early 30s, living in Cadiz, southwestern Spain. He's visiting a temple honoring the great demigod Hercules when he stops at the statue of the conqueror and hero, Alexander the Great. Upon seeing the statue, he begins to weep, for Alexander has built an entire empire and he's achieved glory by the age of 32, while this man, at the same age, has achieved nothing. Inspired by Alexander the Great, this man sets out to achieve greatness. He becomes a politician, war strategist, renowned general for the military. More than 2,000 years later, he is a legend. You know him as Julius Caesar. We often forget that the greatest people in history were once like us. They had hopes, fears, strengths, weaknesses. Their dreams were judged and challenges either by themselves or by others in society. But what set them apart from others, what made them legends, was their determination, perseverance, and dreams. Their willingness to stop at nothing, to do anything to make their dreams reality. With COVID-19, I've seen amazing things happen. People making dreams and achieving them. Have you ever wanted to learn how to bake, but you never had the time? Bake. Have you ever wanted to become more fit, live a healthier life? Live a healthier life. Have you ever wanted to reconnect with people, learn a new skill, discover new hobbies, follow your passions? Do it. Because if anything that I've learned from COVID-19, it's tomorrow is not guaranteed. 
We can't wait until tomorrow anymore. There's no right time, right place, right age. Caesar proved that. Even after quarantine lockdown ends, when things go back to our definition of normal, we need to continue making and achieving our dreams. We need to find a way to keep our natural inclination towards discovering and dreaming alive. We need to find that thing that breaks a cycle, that thing that inspires and motivates us, that thing that makes our lives feel more fulfilled. We need to find a dream. And when you find a dream, if you found a dream, what is stopping you from achieving it? I wanna show you something. When quarantine was at its worst, when I couldn't go out into the world and achieve some of my dreams, what did I do? I walked over to my kitchen and I took an empty jar. And each day, I wrote a few of my jars down. Some of these papers contain my dreams for the future. When COVID-19 ends, when we go back to normal, or even when everything is normal, what I want to do. Some of these are places, skills, experiences, like watch a sunrise for the first time, or finally learned how to do a handstand, or have a movie night with my friends. By writing my dreams down, I remind, my, I remind myself that they aren't just dreams. They're possibilities. Possibilities that I can make happen, that I can achieve. By writing them down, I remind myself that each day has importance and potential. I remind myself that it shouldn't take today for granted. This is my jar of dreams. Six months ago, I asked myself the question, if you knew that the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you accomplish today? By creating this jar of dreams, I hope to make each and every day fun and unpredictable. I hope to make new memories and experiences. I hope to accomplish more with each day that I'm given. But that's only what I'm going to do. I want you to ask yourself this question. What are you going to do when you wake up tomorrow? Thank you. Our next speaker, her topic is um, origins. Where are you from? This simple question isn't so simple for me. Now let me start off by showing you an example of a conversation I have with someone I'm meeting for the first time. Let's say that girl A and I are meeting for the first time. So we start off by having a really, really nice conversation. And then girl A asks, where are you from? So I simply answer, and I mean simply answer. Well, I lived my whole life in Japan and I was born there. And my mom's also Japanese. Though my dad's from Nepal, so I'm half Japanese and half Nepalese. But he grew up in India and he was born there. And my grandma's also like my dad, but in Nepal you have to take the nationality on your dad's side. So both my grandma and my dad are from Nepal. And even if they're born in India, and even if they grew up there. Well, anyways, that's where I'm from. And then girl A says, cool, that sounds kind of complicating. Anyways, where are you from? A reaction like this is quite common. And so one day I decided to change my answer to a more simple answer. I'm from Japan. But the answer I got back was, oh wow, your English is so good. And you don't really look Japanese. To me, this was a quite unexpected answer because I was obviously expecting something more simple and something that didn't judge my looks. And what was even worse was how terribly awkward it felt to say that I was only from Japan. And so for years, my long explanation about my cultural background became the answer to where are you from? One day, a thought appeared in my mind. 
why am I explaining where my parents are from when the one being asked is me? Because what I've been doing all these years was stating where my parents are from instead of stating where I was from. And as I kept thinking about this question, I came to the conclusion that this was because I didn't know where I was from. I simply didn't know where I belonged in, and I simply didn't have a place where I fitted in. I didn't feel like I belonged in one country, but then I didn't feel like I belonged in the other. Yes, I was born in Japan, but no, apparently my physical appearance doesn't look so Japanese. Yes, I look a lot like my dad from Nepal, but no, I can't speak their language and nor was I born there. There were multiple times when the environment around me, the people around me, the society around me, and the mindsets of the people around me made me feel a little distant, made me feel a little different, a little segregated, and a little separated. And that wasn't because I was, you know, affected by the way the people acted around me or any of that. But it was simply because I was trying so hard to fit in, to blend in, and believe that this was where I belonged. It was my mindset and my desire that drove me crazy about wanting to blend in, which was one thing that I could never do, no matter how hard I tried. As I got older, though, I started to realize how fitting into a single place isn't so important. That changing myself and blending in isn't as important as I thought. It was then that I finally realized that what was more important for me was to simply accept my diversity and use that as a tool to understand others. I want the thousands, the millions who are multicultured or stand in a similar condition like me to remember that using your diversity to find a comfortable place and understand others is far more valuable and far more important than forcing yourself to fit in or blend in. I hope the thousands struggling to blend in or struggling to fit in can realize the beauty and the strength of diversity that I wished I could have understand a little sooner. Even now, if people ask me, where are you from? I would probably answer by using my long explanation about my cultural background. But at this time, I wouldn't do so to cover up the fact that I don't know where I truly belong or where I'm from. I would say so to simply tell others that where I'm from, where I belong in, or where I feel like I fit in is undetermined. Now let me end with asking you a very, very simple question. Where are you from? Thank you. The next TED Talk will be about intrinsic motivation. We, we need you to unmute so we can hear you. Sorry. Okay, let me start over live. So, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. When was the last time you were doing something you truly love to do and you felt so engaged you lost sense of time? When was the time you were immersed to just one thing? Let me begin by sharing with you my story. 
So two summers ago, I took a summer course on architecture and my class was working on this project of redesigning a city. There was a day when our professor made us ditch all of our technology completely. Now, collaborating with our peers was an essential process, but we didn't have our 3D computer models that would otherwise help us quickly share our designs without having to physically explain them as much. So that really forced us to think back to our basic design concepts, think carefully about how we were gonna articulate our ideas to our peers and what kind of drawings we would create as we presented our ideas to the class. And there was just something so engaging about that process. We would pin all our designs on the wall across the entire room and it felt amazingly motivating to see our designs slowly develop the more we worked on it and collaborated. We would repeat this process of sketching, discussing, pinning, sketching, discussing, pinning. And during that time, my focus just narrowed. Although the task was a challenge, it almost felt easy to focus because we were so engaged. And for me, that was the last time I felt really engaged to one thing. So even before my summer course, I had an interest in art and design for a while. And when I'm involved in creative work, I feel like I can be my genuine self. It's what intrinsically motivates me. I'm sure you all have different activities that intrinsically motivates you, something you love to do for its own sake. But if I were being entirely honest, it's not always easy to really focus and reap the rewards in this way, because I think it's easy to be distracted. For example, in my art, instead of thinking about things like how the formal qualities of my work will express my intent, I start asking things like, what if everyone else doesn't like my work? How will my work compare to others? How much attention and recognition will I get from, my, from people? And when these thoughts enter my mind, suddenly it becomes harder to focus and really be creative. And what I realized was that these distractions were my extrinsic motivators, um, like getting attention for my work, getting a good review, or if it was for a class, getting a good grade. But the truth is that the more I gave attention and went after these things, the less I actually felt engaged and actually enjoyed my work. Of course, I'm not saying that all extrinsic rewards are bad necessarily, but I wonder how often something like this happens when we focus too much on extrinsic rewards, the, the, we sort of lose our engagement and enjoyment with the task. And I think the problem sort of comes when we become too fixated on what we want to achieve that we forget to take pleasure in the process of the activity. And one intri extrinsic rewards we are all influenced by is this feeling of getting attention. It's a powerful feeling. And the reason why it's more relevant to talk about today is because as media usage and sharing through social media become more and more ubiquitous, it's easy to be distracted by this powerful feeling. For instance, when you're sharing something on social media, you can see exactly how much attention you're getting through features like the number of likes you have. And suddenly these things makes it easier to compare yourself to others. But when we become too caught up on quantifiable numbers, it turns our activity into some kind of competition. And it can just be really frustrating sometimes. But there are some good news because I don't think what we love to do is only defined by extrinsic rewards. Because there's also that other powerful feeling. And it comes when we're able to really put our focus to just one thing, to the things we genuinely love to do. It's like that feeling I was talking about earlier from my summer course when we were when we can really focus and engage better. And it turns out there's a great psychology word that perfectly captures the feeling when we're intrinsically motivated. It's called being in a state of flow. This term was first coined by psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi 
And it's a state when we have energized focus and enjoyment in an activity. In 1992, during the NBA championship, Michael Jordan experienced his flow state when he made six three-pointers in 18 minutes and described the experience as being in the zone. This experience of being in the zone didn't just happen to athletes. Mihal Chiksen Mihal also noticed in noticed this similar experience in all kinds of people, from musicians, writers, artists, and scientists. They were all facing a large challenge and it felt intense, but there was also a sense of relaxation. And during this time, they were able to achieve intense focus. Um, in 1987, the researchers published this eight-channel model of flow, which helps us to understand how we can achieve the state. And sort of in a nutshell, this model shows that we experience flow during the process of overcoming meaningful challenges. And in order to achieve your flow state, you want there to be a challenge that matches your perceived skill. So if an activity is too difficult, you might experience frustration and anxiety. But if something is too easy, you'll experience boredom and apathy. In order to find flow, you want to create that perfect balance in your um, to create that perfect balance in your work. But of course, the biggest factor in achieving your flow state is to be intrinsically motivated. So there are these two powerful feelings when we're enjoying extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards. Now, researchers don't have one single working model of how to reach your flow state because everyone focuses in their own way. But something that helped me sort of reconvene back to my intrinsic motivation is this. It's to revisit sources of inspiration. So in my art, that can mean visiting an art exhibition or looking at great artworks. And when I do these things, I can kind of remember why art gets me excited. Now, I'm not a psychologist. But if there is one thing that I can say for certain is that I can be my most creative self when and really engage better when I manage to focus on a single task and focus on my intrinsic motivation. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Actually, this is all of our talk. And actually, initially, we wanted to do this at school and then invite people. But I guess this online TED Talk is also, it's, it went well. It's not bad. <laughs> and truth be told, we almost uh, gave up doing this TED Talk this year. But thanks to our supervisor, who gave us this uh, such a great opportunity as well as experiences. So thank you very much. And hopefully we will have, I mean, we'll have a new school building next year. So hopefully we can see everyone in a new theater next year. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, all the viewers for watching today as well. Um, personally, I think that TED Club itself is a really, really, great club for anybody and even if you're a bit shy or even if you're not used to public speaking it's a great club to improve those skills it's also a great club for people who are a bit outgoing and who love to um, express their ideas and it's you know a great for any types of people so it's a really nice place to come and join um, we are planning to continue this TED club um, next year as well. So if you are interested at all, or if you like public speaking, or if you want to improve the skills for public speaking, um, it's great. So please join if you want. <laughs> Thank you so much.